Uh, one that's mine is everything matters. Okay. And I always tell people that personally, and I tell everybody that professionally as well. Everything matters, whether it's dust on the floor, napkin on the floor, the wall scuff, is the food hot enough? Are the people waiting in line too long at the club? When we go to court, are we arguing aggressively enough? Do we know if we're using our hands the right way? Mm -hmm. Are we wearing a shirt with the white collar in court when we shouldn't? We should have an all-white shirt on as opposed to one that has a very red tone. Um, everything matters. Uh, you heard me with my camera guys earlier. You know, yeah. so that's probably my personal quote. Um, despite how short it is, that means a lot to me. Okay. And beyond that, for the Cosign audience, um, my dad, Nelson Kelly, has told me something that has stuck with me and that I think should stick with everybody who watches this. Um, he told me that if anybody else has done something before to have success, there's no reason you can't do it. And so even to the people that are looking at me and feel like maybe I've done something that they like, if I've done it, then you can definitely do it too. And credit to UKG and for Cosign for giving the people an opportunity to hear me and to hear me again reemphasize that if I've done it, you can do it. Um, and you can do it much better than me because that's how this world works out. You just got to put the work in. What up, world? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Cosign Conversations podcast. As you can see, we're not at Cosign Loft. We are here in downtown Dallas at Kevin Kelly's official law firm. He also has Vivo Kitchen and Cocktail. We're going to get into that in the podcast. But Kevin, how you doing today? Man, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on today. Man, of course, of course. Man, you do a lot. You're a father, entrepreneur, attorney, investor. Man, how do you have time to do everything, brother? Man, I don't do enough, man. I need to do okay. more. So I don't ever feel like I don't have time to do the things that are before me. Right. I mean, I've got so many more plans and visions and so many more people that I want to eat with me that, mm. you know, I got to stay hungry. So the minute I start to feel like I've got too much, right. you know, my thought process is why would God bless me with more? That's real. So I don't have enough going on. I need more. Hey, I, I got some stuff for you, though. Let's go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you said eat with me, and I wanted to ask you this. What's up with the sharks, man? We have this beautiful shark in front of us. I was on your IG page. You got the sharks in your box. So talk to us about the the importance of the replica of a shark for you? You know what? A shark is a symbol of aquatic aggression, man. Okay. And whether we're in water, land, air, you know, I want my team to always be aggressive in what they do. Mm. I was talking to my team earlier today and I was telling them that, you know, whatever you do, make decisions with speed. Just go. Okay. And when you make decisions with speed, you're going to make mistakes. Maybe you hire somebody too fast. Maybe you um, draft a motion too fast. Or maybe you come up with a thought and an argument that's too fast. But, you know, by the time you pick yourself up, Keep sprinting, keep going with speed. You'll make a mistake again, but by the time you're finished, you'll be ahead of everybody else who is jogging. You'll have time to dust your knees off, look at your first place medal, and then look back at those people who are jogging the whole time. So that shark symbolizes speed and aggression. That's what's up. And also when people make uh, decisions fast with speed, it reduces the second guessing. Sure. A lot of people second guess themselves all the time. And I'm like, just go with your first instinct. Your first intuition is going to lead you in the right direction. Yeah, I think we all second guess ourselves from time to time, but we want to minimize it as much as possible because... Usually when we decide to engage in a venture, whether it's me, you, or anybody else, we've already put enough thought into it in the first place. So once we're at it, we might as well just go. So, so speaking of putting thought into it, so a lot of people originally know you as an attorney, right? Correct. But you, you, you ventured off, uh, started with investments, ended up getting this beautiful established kitchen and cocktails. How much thought do you put into doing a new deal? Like, what does that process look like for you? You know, I try to be calculated with all the things that I engage in. Um, whether it's a investment that I have 100% ownership in, or even if it's an angel investment that somebody else has brought to the table and I have a chance to get some equity by putting some cash into a deal. So you know, I try to be really, really calculated and I try to be thoughtful with everything that I do business-wise. And what does that look like for you? Because let's say we're on Shark Tank. People's going to come with you all these type of deals, right? What's attractive for you? Like, what do they need to have in place for you to even consider taking a look at it? You know, that's that, that's difficult. The majority of my deals are ones that I've funded, ones okay. that have been my thought process. So Kelly Law Firm, Kitchen and Cocktails, Vivo, my real estate, I own 100% of all of it. Okay. I do have angel investments that are out there too. And so when I look at an angel investment or an outside venture, you know, ultimately you want to believe in the people. Okay. You know, if you have a fantastic person who has good character, good quality, mm -hmm. that's something that you don't, that's something or someone you don't mind getting behind. Mm -hmm. And then if they got an idea that maybe you think you can make better, I think it makes sense to engage in some of those too. You know, there are other ventures such as I'm involved in a deal with Playboy, the brand. Uh, okay. There's an alcohol co called Rare Hairs that's in the market. Okay. Uh, Rare Hair is a fantastic deal because the founder of Rare Hair had another alcohol he had brought to the market. He sold it at a nine figure number. Nice. And so with him coming into the alcohol game with another spirit, it made sense to go and back him financially like a number of other people did at a much higher number than me, some at a lower number than me. Got you. Does, um, 
does money scare you at all? What I mean by that is, you know, you, you came from humble beginnings, but you've been able to become successful, right? When you look at a deal and let's say it's a high figure deal that you're about to invest in, does numbers scare you? Or you understand that like, if something happens tomorrow and I lose everything, I know I can get it back because I'm a shark. You know, I don't, that's, that's a deep question. I don't say, I don't think the numbers scare me. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to be mindful of what you do and how you invest. I'm not in a position now where I have to say that I'm going to invest everything that I have in one deal to try to make it work. Right. Maybe the right deal hasn't come to me, okay. um, but I don't, money doesn't scare me. You know, gotcha. to me, money is an opportunity to really money is important because it allows you to expand and to get more money. Capital mm -hmm. is key. And so if you have capital, I don't think you should move with fear because you want to be beyond the position that you're currently in. Gotcha. And the only way you can do that is to find the right opportunities to invest in. Mm -hmm. So there's this conversation that goes on social media that says, some people say money can't buy happiness. Some people say money buys peace. Mm -hmm. I say money buys freedom. What do you believe? <laughs> Man, I think money buys it all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and money isn't the most important thing right, in the right, world. Right. I think, for me, I think love and ideas are the most important things. For sure. Um, but money makes a difference, man. So when somebody says, well, money doesn't buy happiness, well, you might be happy in, a, in an outfit you see at the mall. Or, you right. know, if you're riding in, if you get a chance to ride in that Maybach, would that make you happy? And, you know, Money does make a difference. And beyond just your individual thoughts and what you want, you know, we all usually have, or most of us have people that we love, people that we care about. Mm -hmm. What does money allow us to do for them? Take care um, of them. I have a grandmother who passed earlier this year. I loved her very dearly. She actually gave me the money to start my first business, my law firm. She gave me a thousand bucks. Okay. And so when you talk about where the money can buy happiness, I was able to use my capital to buy her a house in DeSoto, cash it out, and give her the chance to be around my family and to be around me. And so her last days that she spent living was in a house that I took care of and that I provided for her. So um, those are the kind of things that I think of when the thought does can money buy happiness. Mm -hmm. And the happiness isn't just spending money in the club or spending it on people, but what can you do to secure your family and make sure they're okay? So uh, I do think that in some realms, uh, money can buy happiness. Now, that's amazing. Speaking of your investment that your, your, your grandmother made in you, you were telling me a story offline about how instead of buying a Bentley, you invested that. Kind of talk to us about that real quick for the people that couldn't be in our personal conversation. Yeah, we were talking earlier about uh, some of the things that I've invested in, especially early on. And I said the stock market has always been something that I've been fond of. Because right. if you look back over time, the past hundred or so years, those that have progressed have usually been people who have market investments. Mm -hmm. And especially people who invest in the market when it's down and they ride it when it goes back up. Right. And we were talking about how one of my first big purchases was going to be a Bentley convertible. Cash, you said. He black, was going to pay cash. Yeah, black, black, <laughs> black was going to cash that out too. Yeah. Buddies were excited. I was excited. But something said, you know, hey, let's put money into the market. Mm -hmm. And one of my investments with that capital was American Airlines. And I bought American Airlines at 50 cents a share. Mm -hmm. um, it went down to 41, 49 cents. And I got nervous, right? <laughs> I would have But um, that 50 cents a share ended up putting me in a position where every dollar that I invested turned into $40 before I mm -hmm. sold. And so those are the kind of investments that have helped me to this day. Mm -hmm. Everything hasn't been a winner. You lose sometimes, too. But I mean, for the most part, that was a good deal. And I look forward to future ones. So now we have platforms like Earn Your Leisure, which can like kind of walk us to, uh, you know, some investments. But I think a lot of the people problem that they have is, let's say they get in a good deal like you got in. They don't know when to sell. They try. Maybe they hold on to it. They don't know when to exit. Like, what would be your a piece of advice when it comes to like investing in stocks? When would do you sell or do you are you a buy and hold type of person? You know what? I think it really depends on the equity. OK. You know, if you for me, I like to invest in companies that I know that I believe in and that I Right. And so for me, Nike is a long-term stock. I like yes. Nike. Yeah, as yeah. much as I like Gucci, I don't buy the Adidas collection because I'm a Nike guy. Gotcha. And so I stand behind that Apple. My entire platforms with my office are, are Apple products, mm. whether it's Apple phones, iPads, Apple computers. And so Apple for me is a company that I believe is built to last and it's a long-term hold. Gotcha. Now, when you start to veer from that philosophy, you know, again, we talk about you don't always win. Peloton. Right. I made big investments in Peloton. I lost 90% of what I invested in Peloton. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, maybe I wasn't working out enough to support the company, gotcha, right? Gotcha. But, you know, I lost money on that. I lost a lot of money on Moderna. Um, mm, I was in a Moderna phase, too. Yeah, I was in Moderna. I had big wins in Moderna. Mm -hmm. Dang, they doubled my money with that. And then yeah. ended up selling it at probably about 20% of what I initially invested. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have your wins, but you have your losses, too. The most important thing is to stay in the game. Keep hustling. And to keep making sure your primary hustle, at least, is one that's good enough to fuel everything else you want to do. So you have me at Nike because Nike is one of my favorite brands, right? But for me, it's more about like the storytelling component, right? right. Like Nike makes me believe that I can still be an athlete and I look good in it, right? So what? The, how do you resonate with Nike? You know what? Um, from being a boy, Nike has always been the, br the best brand storytellers, mm -hmm. whether it's Bo Jackson, Deion Sanders, Air Jordans, the way that they've been able to package their product mm -hmm. and to get you to believe in them. You know, it's more than just a shoe company. It's a mission. 
uh, and their products is quality too. And I think they're an example for definitely for my companies, but for other companies as well. Now that's amazing. I, I want to get into that because when you when you launched Kitchen and Cocktails, was it like right at the beginning of COVID or was it? It was kind of in the middle. Yeah, in the middle of COVID. Uh, kind of talk to us about like the difficulties of doing your first one opposed to now you have three locations, which we're definitely going to get into. Now you have three of them, but how was like, how hard or how easy was it to get over the hurdle of that first one? You know what? Um, I don't really look at it as it being hard. Okay. And there were challenges along the way. Don't get me right. wrong. I mean, we've hired hundreds of people to work downstairs. So sometimes you don't have the right chefs. Sometimes you don't have the right management team, but it's just all part of the process. To me, business is sport. And so True. if I miss a couple shots, I'm not really worried because I know I'm going to get the opportunity to take more shots. Keep you. Um, with Kitchen and Cocktails, the biggest challenge was probably that it was in the middle of the pandemic. Right. Um, but it worked out well for us because it gave us a reason to put more thought into what we do. Mm. OK, let's make sure we have a to go program. OK, people won't want to dine in the restaurant. So, you know, what can we do to make the experience for those who are going to dine in a good experience? Mm. Um, what ended up happening and ended up being a challenge for us was that when we opened Kitchen and Cocktails, um, we opened to full capacity. I mean, yeah. capacity, I think at the time was 50%. Mm. There was no space in the restaurant. And then it happened to be a time too where we hadn't seen each other. Mm. So we're in the yeah. restaurant and people are eating their food, but they don't want to leave because leave. they're happy to see each other. So we dealt with time. ticket time, staff issues, but you know, in hindsight, those were all beautiful things. So now that we move towards opening up our DC location, any issue we've had opening in Dallas, mm. we didn't have them in Chicago. Any mm. issue we had in Chicago, we're not going to have them in DC. And a big part of that is mindset, too. You know, any problem that we've had at Kitchen and Cocktails, whether it's been dress code, whether it's been food, whether it's been drinks, it's my fault. Okay. It's all my fault. Why do you say that? Well, because I own the concept, and I've okay. got complete control of what does and what does not happen. Mm. What I'm trying to do is be accountable. Okay. And as I'm accountable, I'm trying to build a team that has accountability as well. And so if we have a culture of accountability where each person beneath me says, hey, this is my fault, this is my fault, then what they'll do is they'll say, for example, with me going into D.C., I'm not going to open at 100% capacity like I did in Chicago. I'm going to open at 50% capacity. Okay. I'm not going to say I'm not going to do a soft opening because I got restaurants. I know how this goes. We're going to do three soft openings before we go to D.C. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to wait two to four weeks before we open in D.C. to hire a management team. My management team is hired a couple months before, and I can't wait for them to get, get rocking on the That's 10th of, of April. So okay. being accountable and saying these are mistakes that happen, and they're my fault. Okay. I don't look to anybody else. I look at myself. And I fix what I've done wrong. Mm. And now, if I can get a team of people to be that same way, then the sky's the limit. Mm. Is that a learned behavior or is that something that's just naturally within you? I think it's learned. Okay. You know, a lot of people will look at me now and say, man, this guy's, this guy's a killer, man. He's going hard with business. You know, this guy seems to, to have it all and be sharp. Right. But it hasn't always been that way. I spend so much time reading books. I've been to two different conferences in the past couple of weeks. I was at the bar and restaurant conference this week. Um, Two weeks ago, I was at South by Southwest. Okay. I'm waiting for the next conferences to pop up, too, so I can educate myself. And so um, my mindset in terms of education keeps evolving because I'm giving myself access to information. Mm -hmm. I'm not ignoring books. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm looking at people who are more successful than me, and I'm mm -hmm. looking for their interviews. I'm looking at them online. And that's the stuff that's making me better. Uh, but also, with the little bit of success that we've had, I want more, man. Mm -hmm. I'm hungrier than I've ever been. Same. I come to work every day like I don't have nothing, KG. Mm -hmm. I want it, man. And I'm going to get up seven days a week and I'm going to work for it until I have whatever respect, respectfully it may be. Mm. You're speaking of it, you don't know what it is yet, do you? I don't know. Not till you get it. Right. I like what I'm doing, though, man. <laughs> I'm having fun with work, man. Right. I enjoy the people that I work with. And more important than anything else, I mean, I, I never would have imagined the, the honor and the pride that I feel in being a servant, man. Mm. Man, I'm so happy to serve people. I can't explain it. I was just talking to. My son Christian and I were just walking through the restaurant on the way uh, to this conversation, and there were a couple of ladies who stopped me and they said, "Hey, are you the owner?" I said, "Yeah, I'm the owner. What are y'all doing here in town? How are things going?" Mm -hmm. They had South Carolina shirts on. Okay. I said, "Well, hey, we're here for the final four, and we heard this was the best place to eat, and we wanted to come in." Well, hey, I'm glad you're here. You enjoy yourselves. Are you coming for brunch? Because brunch is fantastic. Yeah. They explained one was coming to brunch, the other one didn't have a reservation. Yeah. So I told her to look me up online. I'll make sure she gets the reservation she wants. And she gave me such good energy and the other three ladies good energies that I ended up telling my manager to come over and I said, hey, take care of these ladies' meal today. It's on me. That's amazing. They were happy, but they don't understand how much they did for me. Right. Because I serve every single day. Sometimes you have ups and sometimes you have downs, but when people are kind to you, it, it, it makes you feel good about doing what you do. And for me, I'm a servant, man. I'm a servant of Dallas. I'm a servant of Chicago. I'm a servant of D.C. And, you know, it's just a privilege. 
Speaking of those lo locations, um, being a server, what made you choose to serve in those other two locations exactly? Like why Chicago and why DC? All right. Chicago looks similar to Dallas. Okay. You know, one of the things that I've learned over time is that whenever you make decisions, try to be as data driven as possible. Um, if you had have asked me where I would have wanted to be, I would probably would have said, hey, I'm going to open up in Miami because <laughs> I, love, I love Miami, I'm right? <laughs> but does the, does the populace of Miami look comparative to the populace of Dallas where I won before? Well, Chicago looks similar to Dallas, and so it made sense to open there. When you talk about D.C., it's the nation's capital. It's Chocolate City. Yeah. I believe that my chefs are fantastic. I believe my management team is fantastic. And I think we've got something for the city of D.C. We're, we're excited and we're honored at the opportunity to serve, and so D.C. is where we've chosen next. I know nothing's guaranteed, but I just feel like D.C. is going to be an automatic one. Like, just the culture in D.C. You know what? I hope so, but I'm not going to take it for granted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take it for granted, but I hope so. We're definitely putting in the work to make sure we have success. You said something that, um, that, that I really want to go back to is you said there was a turning point, right, in your life that you wasn't always the man you are today, right? What do you think that turning point was? Because I may have a lot of colleagues or friends who are, you know, kind of like myself. They're kind of laid back, but right. they get the work done, but... They, they need a little more edge to them to get them over that hump. What was it for you? Was it a, was it a failure? Was somebody, did somebody tell you no? Did somebody doubt you? And after that moment, you just turned up? What was that moment for you, if you remember? You know what? It's, it's been various turning points. I played basketball in high school. I was never the man. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? When I go to college, I'm going to be the man. Okay. You know, I didn't play basketball, but I was Mr. Freshman. I was the homecoming king. I was, yeah. I was the president of my uh, chapter of Cap Alpha Psi. Mm -hmm. Um, when I was leaving college, I said, you know, hey, I'm doing good here, but there are people doing better. So I'm going to step it up and I'm going to go to law school. And that pushed me to go to law school because I wanted more. Um, in law school, I studied hard, but I didn't do well academically because I didn't have that background they had. So gotcha. Some things you can't make up for. Uh, fortunately, I had a good enough relationships with people and good enough conversations that I always kept a job in law school and I had good opportunities. Um, but leaving that situation, I said, you know what, when I leave law school, I want to be want to be more important than the people that I'm in school with. And a lot have done well, and so I, I definitely respect everyone's path. I've done okay, too, but that's what pushed me to graduate a semester early. Mm -hmm. And so when I was walking across stage with my classmates in May, they were handing out numbers so they could explain where they were going to study for the bar at. I was handing out my business card because I was already <laughs> licensed at that point. That's what so I didn't let that hold me back. And even with, with law as well, you know, I've been fortunate enough to do well with law. I got my first multi-million dollar settlement my first year. Okay. Um, and I've just fueled that into more success, but it's just wanting more. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and seeing people who are fantastic, man, there are a lot of fantastic people in this world who do what you do, who do what I do, and have accomplished so much more. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to see them win and have success and not say, I'd like a little bit of that for myself too. Right. So that's what keeps me going. Did you have a mentor? Do I have one or yeah. did I have one? You know, there have been a lot of people who've helped me over time. I right. had a mentor named John Walker, okay. who was a state representative out of, out of Arkansas. Fantastic guy. He passed him years ago, but mm -hmm. he was really, really good to me. Senator Royce West here in Dallas has been good okay. to me. And a lot of people ask me about mentorship, but my biggest mentor is probably YouTube. Okay. You know, I can, there, there's not a person who's successful that I can't listen to their story. I can't watch their story online. If I'm not picking up a book, listening to an audio book, I can go to YouTube and I can learn and figure out how to have success based on what other people are sharing with me. And maybe somebody will listen to this interview and they'll say, you know, I'm picking up some things from KG sure. and Cosign and this is how I'm going to have success too. The reason why I asked that is because a lot of people that I interviewed in the past say they had a mentor. That was a turning point. For me, I've never had a mentor, but I always told myself I had hustle. I'll, I'll figure it out and I'll work through it. Right. But what I've seen um, from you just being around you the, the few period of times is that without you probably knowing is you, you mentor the people you work with. Like you want them to be at their best and at all the time. Like you always talk about preaching excellence. Right. And I feel like not only like your employees, but people need that within their lives. So uh, I want to commend you on that because, you know, when I was still working, I wish I could have worked for somebody like you that I would admire, look up to, and respect what they're saying instead of people who just, you know, telling you what not, to, telling you what to do, but not kind of investing in your future. Right. You know what, that's, first of all, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, but I want to be a good person, man. I have a good mom. I have a good father. And um, I've got good friends around me. I've got a really good circle of people with high character. And so it's one thing for me to win. Don't worry about me. I'm going to win. Yeah. If I have people around me who commit to the same cause that I commit to, then why wouldn't I want them to be better? Mm. Um, I've got a young man I just hired who handles PR for me named Miles Delgado. Shout I told to Miles, hey, man, if you give me two years, I'm going to make you the best PR person in Dallas. But you got to be able to go through it because mm -hmm. we go hard here. Yes. You're going to work directly with me, and I'm going to push you. Mm -hmm. And so if you want this push, if you want to be better, then I'm going to give it to you. But, you know, I've got an obligation to do what I can for people. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could reach more people, but... That's why I'm thankful for this interview and for this platform, because maybe something I say can help someone else out. But 
Um, when it comes to mentoring and trying to make people better, um, I'd be a bad person if I if I wasn't trying to be an influencer. Right. If I was only trying to win for myself, mm-hmm. now, there's, there's enough wins for all of us here. And me having somebody successful around me or helping somebody be successful doesn't mean that I can't keep winning as well. For sure, you say you read a lot. Do you um do you promote any books uh, for your you know your colleagues or your employees to like Hey, you should read this book. Yeah, I do. What's that? What's that one? Probably why should white guys have all the fun. Why should white guys have all the fun? That, that's a that's the number one read there um, by Reginald Lewis. I'm gonna get you a copy. Of that. Okay. Um, it's a fantastic book. It talks about Reginald Lewis's path through entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. uh, getting into Harvard Law School without even taking the law school admissions test. Uh, he was the first black billionaire, another member of Cap Alpha Psi fraternity. Mm-hmm. He passed before his time, but his story is one that's entertaining, but it's also a story or a roadmap for business as well. And so that's mm-hmm. helpful for my son Christian, who's 16, and my son Kevin, who's 18, that's on his way to Princeton, mm-hmm. who wants to amazing. do private equity, similar to what Reginald Lewis did. Okay, that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm glad you talked about that. Um, so I have a 15 year old daughter, right? And I'm currently in this space where, when I'm with her all the time, I try to I try to entertain her because right. you know, um, unfortunately, me and her mom don't live together. So the time we do have, I want to make sure she's having a good time. I want to make sure she sees Dallas, has experiences. But what I've seen, just kind of like just watching you and other amazing fathers, is that you embed your kids in your lifestyle and what you have got going on, and um, you you allow them to be inside to make decisions be informed so that I can see what you do. Was that something that you always knew when you became a father, you was gonna make sure your kids um, had all the information or was that something that you learned as you're going on? Because I'm just learning this now 15 years late, but now right. I'm embedding her and everything. Like she's working with Cosign, she does our social media, she works the door so that way she can be confident enough to speak to strangers, introduce herself, be able to ask for what it is and stay firm. Right. So I'm starting out those positions so that she could learn her business. What was it for you that made you want to embed your kids into your lifestyle and, and, and career? You know what, like like many parents, I love my kids. Right. And like many parents, I want them to be better than me. Mm. And so in order for them to be better than me, then at a minimum, let me give you all of me. Okay. Let me show you everything that I do. So when my boys were young, they played uh, soccer quite a bit. Mm. And I always trained them. I left work early to train them and to make sure they were active. Uh, my younger son, Christian, who's 16, has been ranked as number eight in the country. Wow. Uh, Kevin, who is 18, has been ranked as high as number 11 in the country. Now, Christian broke his ankle last year. He's ranked 35, I think. The last I checked, Kevin, who's 18, was ranked 27 in the country. Mm -hmm. But with business, I've always brought them around what I do. This is why you have the chance to go to these teams, to go to these clubs, to train in these countries, Um, understand the men who are with me, learn to build a team early because my top people are guys that I've been with since I was 18, 19 years old. That's LeBron. So, yeah, yeah. And so Aaron Brown, Mike Ashton, Chris Petrie, those guys have been with me since I didn't have anything. And so teaching them that. But even with business, too, you'd be amazed, man. Business is a, is a, is a ball of challenges, but children are, are, are very high IQ. And if we give them those challenges, they can figure them out, too. The important thing is that if we give them those challenges now, then when they're our age, these challenges are nothing to them. And so I've been fortunate enough to have two kids that I've been around. I like them a lot. Um, they like me most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's allowed me to position them to do well with sports, but also with school, too. And, and so, again, the, the hopes for them are fantastic. Kevin's been fortunate enough to secure an internship this summer oh, wow. uh, with a private equity company uh, called Pharaoh's Capital, owned by a guy named Neil Youngblood, who's here in Dallas. Okay. And uh, I'm proud of him and his path he's going to be on. Mm-hmm. He wants to be a billionaire. And so he actually has turned down professional offers in Spain, in, no, in, in Germany, in France, and in Brazil as well. Because oh, wow. he says that he'd like to own a team. And so he knows that he needs to sacrifice now, go to Princeton, learn finance, and that's going to position him better than being maybe a middling pro. But it's, everything has been calculated with them from an early age. Even Kevin's decision to go to Princeton. He was recruited by North Carolina, by Stanford, UCLA, Virginia, Georgetown, seemingly every school in the country. Um, and we turned down all those schools for him to go to Princeton, a school that can't give a scholarship. Right. Why? We're making calculated business decisions about what's going to be best long term. Even gotcha. my younger son, Christian, um, he had the same lineup for him. And so he goes on a recruiting trip to Kentucky comes back and says he's going to reclassify. He's going to go to school a year early. Okay. And, um, say, hey, why are you going to go to Kentucky, man? Oh, man, the girls are on campus, Dad. <laughs> I saw Coach Calipari, man. I saw they, they valet his car. Yeah. I was at the football game. Mm. And so I said, all right, first of all, hell no, you're not going to Kentucky. <laughs> but I go to a holiday party the next week, and, and some friends of mine are asking me about my sons. They're happy that Kevin's going to Princeton because it's the number one school in the country. And so I'm telling them the story about Christian. And they said, well, why aren't you making him go to Princeton, too? And so I'm like, well, you know, you said he wants to check out UVA and Clemson and take other trips. And they say, but if he can get into school there, Mm -hmm. you got to understand what those doors mean when they're open for you. And so why is he making the decision? 
And so I left that, I left that uh, holiday party feeling deficient as a dad, like, man, these guys are right. right. This kid's 16 years old. I need to be telling him what he's going to do. Mm. And so he'll take a trip to Princeton by the time this comes out in the next three weeks or so. But when he goes to Princeton's campus, he's going to commit there. Okay. And so it's taking him past where the coaches are calling his brother saying, hey, the younger brother's not picking up our <laughs> phone call. He won't return, return our text message. Right. No, nah, you're taking your ass to where your brother is because um, if you don't go the pro route, we're going to figure out how to get this bag, man. You ain't going to get sure. this money I'm getting. You're going to get this money that's much higher than mine. For sure. That's amazing. You said that's going to ask you, like, what's your... What is your role? Is it more so as advisor or is it more so you letting them make decisions? But sometimes you got to <laughs> But I see that you stepping in to make the decision. Man, man, KG, you got to check it out, man. It goes from when they're young from being a dictatorship to a democracy. <laughs> but I still have the traits of a dictator. So it really depends on what's going on. Oh, for man. sure. You, you pick and choose which one. I pick, I pick and choose, man. <laughs> what would you say is uh, your proudest moment when it comes to your boys? Like, what are you most proud of? Um, probably their mindset mm. when they step into business. These guys make decisions sometimes that I can't make. Mm. I'm a very compassionate guy. I love my people. They're compassionate. They love people too. But some of the stuff that I deal with, they don't tolerate. Okay. Hey, Dad, why is this person still in the chat if they're doing this? Mm. Well, you know, they've been here for a while, and hey, but if they're not performing, get them out of there. Mm. You know, uh, my older son, Kevin, when it comes to business, he's ruthless, man. Mm. He doesn't play any games. <laughs> if something is wrong, he's, he's like, cut it out. Mm. And... Um, for example, we had an issue with the kitchen at the restaurant in Dallas about two weeks ago. Two guys got into a fight, right? In the kitchen. And so I was out of town. And so I called Kevin. He, had, he was actually headed to the restaurant with his girlfriend. I said, hey, step into the kitchen and pull those guys to the side and have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. And so I called my staff earlier and said, how'd the conversation go with Kevin? And said, you know, hey, boss, Kevin laid it down straight. He said, hey, you know, just as easy as it was for you to get the job, it's even easier for us to fire you. Mm -hmm. So if you want to work here, you carry yourself like it's a privilege to be here. And if you can't perform that way, then we're going to let you go today or we're going to let you go another day. Mm -hmm. And so that type trait is why they'll be able to have success because they won't always be on the, oh, let me baby my employees mm -hmm. or other side like I am. And like a lot of our people are. But when yeah. you look at the majority, when it comes to business, they don't play around, man. Business is business. Personal is personal. And sometimes in business, we care so much for our people because we've come from nothing and we give opportunities to people who don't deserve them because maybe at a time we didn't deserve them, that we often suffer because of, of, of the opportunities that we give others or the chances that we make. But, you know, these guys that I'm developing, I want them to be ruthless when it comes to business. Have compassion, have care, but, you know, understand that when it takes to coming to a different level, you got to have that mamba mentality sometimes and you got to have that, that killer instinct that Jordan had as well. That's amazing. So when you mentioned mama mentality, I, ha I have to ask this. When it comes to life and business, would you say you're more Kobe or more Jordan? Both dogs, it, but it, different. It, de it depends. A little bit of both. And I say okay. it depends. And I talk to my sons about this, too, because Kobe is just, he'll just tear your heart out. He doesn't care. He moves with any thought, any consideration of you whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But Jordan's that guy who's going to sit down with you. He's going to play cards maybe the night before the game, smoke mm -hmm. cigars. Then he's going to tear your heart out. All right. So, you know, as I explain those two, I'm more Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more Kobe for sure because I'm not going to uh, sit in your face and fake with you. I'm not going to act like I want to converse with you or be around you if there's no reason to be around you, no energy, or if I think that we have conflict of business reasons. So I'm not, I'm more Kobe with it. So this is my guys for that, but that means you got no LeBron in you then. <laughs> nah, nah, we ain't passing the ball, man. I'm taking all the shots. <laughs> you taking all the nah, shots. But, but you know, LeBron is an uh, epitome of greatness too. I mean, what, oh, what LeBron sure. has done, if you were to ask me, do I have any LeBron in me, I would probably reference my team. Okay. I've got 450 right. employees. We'll add at least another 100 going into D.C. Mm -hmm. But my sister is my CFO. Okay. She is a CPA, KPMG trained mm -hmm. uh, CFO who's fantastic. My mother is my operations manager. My father works in marketing for me. Mm -hmm. My three top advisors are Aaron Brown, Mike Ashton, Chris Petrie. Mm -hmm. Patricia Morgan is a young woman who's like a sister to me. She's been with me for seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. She's my general counsel of my concepts and runs my law firm for me. Um, who am I missing? Uh, Andrew Thomas, my COO, that's my first cousin. Okay, and so yeah. I've been able to, let me, let me rephrase it. I'm not going to say I've been able to bring along people. Right. We've been able to grow together. Okay. And I say that because it's not just me with the talent. It's them with the talent that's coming to the table too. And we're working to build some really good things for the public. Okay. I'm going to ask you this question, and I, I hope I word, I word this right. So uh, a lot of your core team, executive C-suite team, right, is family, right? Mm -hmm. Do, did you train them as you went along? Or did you let them learn the chicken trade, the trades of the business first, and then come with you? And the reason why I ask that is because a lot of times we hire friends and family, mm -hmm. but some people say you're supposed to hire people who are more experienced than you. That right. way, they could handle where you lack at. So, how was it for you? 
You know what? I'm very fortunate that we've been able to grow together. Okay. But I don't have people on my team that weren't quality in the beginning. Okay. Uh, character's big. And so my people have the best character. But all of my people are educated, too. Each of these people have degrees. They've been in college. They understand math, science. They understand relations and things of that sort. For sure. And so despite what they came to the table with on paper, we've still grown quite a bit. Because where we are now is not where we were five years ago. You know, I've had a successful law firm for a number of years. I've recovered over half a billion dollars for people. Mm. But that only took 30 people to do that. Um, over the past few years or so, since I've added the restaurant, now we've grown from 30 employees to 450 employees over a period mm. of about three years. And so that's been an adjustment for us. We're projected to be at about 800 employees over the next mm. 18 months. And so we get better um, as time passes, as we add more concepts. But we try to add talent, too. Right. Uh, Tyler Castro, who's a uh, director for my concepts, He's somebody that came to us as a consultant. We hired him on full time and he's done a fantastic job helping us grow. Okay. Um, our culinary director of uh, Vanessa Brown has done a good job understanding the back of the house and growing with us and doing what she needs to do as well. Um, my executive chef, Michael McLaurin, he came to us from the Del Frisco's family tree. He was okay. quality. And now that he's with us, it's a different type of concept and he's just grown and gotten better too. So, you know, our core team is good, but we keep getting better because we're hungry and we know there's a lot out there. And, and what's out there is an opportunity for us to serve the public. And we believe we're going to serve them well. Got you. I don't want to focus on money because, you know, money is just a tool, but it helps people understand concepts, right? So kind of talk to us. It might be different for you, but kind of talk to us the difference between making your first 100K to somebody's first million. Like what, like what did you do differently to 10X that? Or what could somebody do differently if they made 100K, but they're struggling to make a million? You know, it's, that's, that's interesting because things are all relative. Okay. You know, in some sense, the, the first 100K is the first million. Mm. Because when you get to that next level, you're years ahead, you're experiencing different things. Um, the first 100K was just, a, I'm having success in business. Okay. You know, let me go buy this Lexus over here. It's mm. all good. You know, I can go to the dealership and get a car and not have to call a relative and see if they're going to post something. <laughs> right. Um, that first million is a little different because you have more capital. Mm. If you come from humble beginnings and you keep that same mindset, you don't need as much as that million may provide for you. Okay. So that gives you the opportunity to invest, to see other opportunities, to see what you can do for other people as well. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably the difference between that first 100,000 and that first million. Mm -hmm. Then when you go from that first 100,000 to the first million, to, for example, the next to, to the 10 million, right. then it's, okay, well, how can I expand my reach? How can I scale concepts that I have? How can I acquire more real estate? What can I do? You start thinking, okay, what does my legacy need? Right. Not now, but maybe 20, 30 years down the line. So things change a bit. Who do you add from a million to 10 million? Because I know at that point, you're going to have to develop more uh, executives. Like, who, yeah. do you add a CFO at that point? Do you already have a CFO? Who do you add to help you get to that, you know, that next 10X? You know, a CFO is an important part of the process. Right. Um, finance, you know, they say the majority of businesses fail, fail because they don't know their numbers. Right. And so when you have a CFO, who your CFO, your finance person is going to know their numbers. But it's their job to make sure you understand them as well. Because if they know your numbers, but you don't know them and you're making the decisions, then you're going to be at a loss. Um, beyond that, too, you want to have a complete situation. My CFO is phenomenal. Um, she's one of the most intelligent people that I know. Her name is Andra Wilmore. She's my sister. Um, but she, she sees the totality of circumstances, too, such as me getting paid. And so she's like, well, hey, we have to make sure all the employees are paid, make sure our investment is right. But if Kevin's not getting paid, then nobody else should be getting paid because these are his concepts. Right. As an owner, that makes a difference, too. So you want to find somebody who's going to be for the business, for the customer, but also for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that finance person is important. And even if you're not at the 10 million stage, if you're at the 1 million stage, it's important. If you're at the $200,000 stage, you need to have the right finance person. Maybe it's not a full-time CFO, like a fractional CFO, but it could be somebody who's a CPA that works with you that can give you your profit and loss statements, your balance sheet, and other things that can let you know the health of your business. Mm. One thing that I also commend you on is you own your building, right? Um, I was having a discussion with somebody versus talking about leasing a building and talking about negotiations. Right. You being a shark, I know you're a beast at negotiating, right? So what are some things people should negotiate when they're looking to get a brick and mortar? Because a lot of times I feel like people are just so excited to get a building, they don't negotiate terms, length, uh, price, you know, whether stuff to fix. So what are some things we can negotiate when we're looking into get maybe like a commercial property, whether it's lease or buy something? Right. Um, ne negotiate it all. Okay. Negotiate it all. Now, with me saying negotiate it all, if you find a good lease or buy opportunity, uh, don't run the opportunity away from you because gotcha. you're going too hard. Mm -hmm. The most successful negotiations are ones where both parties walk, and walk away feeling like they haven't won it all, feeling mm -hmm. like they've give, given something up, okay. they can live with what their circumstances are. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as the lease buy situation, I'm going to take you somewhere else. Okay. Um, I think everybody should buy. 
Bye. It takes time. Uh, my first building wasn't a purchase because I just started with business. I was at 1700 Commerce when I first started. Okay. Then I went to 325 North St. Paul. And my next purchase was a building that was in Deep Ellum, 2614 Main. I think it's a sweet green building now. Okay. Um, acquiring, actually, that wasn't my next purchase. I acquired some real estate that I was going to build on. But acquiring real estate is a game changer, okay. especially commercial real estate. The value of a home appreciates a certain way. But if you get a commercial property, it's going to pre- appreciate in a lot more expansive manner. Um, the building that we're in, for example, is 53,000 square feet. I bought it at one rate. It's appreciated many millions in value since I purchased the building to the point that the next building that I bought, which is a 24,000 square foot building, that's going to be turned into a 37,000 square foot indoor-outdoor development. I bought that building with no money down. Wow. And I said, hey, I've got millions in equity in this building. I want the building. I'm not putting any money down. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's make sure we make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a fantastic banker at the, at, uh, by the name of uh, Brandon Perry at Hancock Whitney Bank. Okay. He made it happen for me, but real estate allows that to happen. If I don't have that commercial real estate, then maybe I can't buy that next building without putting any money down. I mean, how many people buy commercial buildings and they come out of the pocket zero? I haven't heard, I've heard of it. Getting that first one is the way. And getting a good banker like Brandon's meant for me is the way also. Okay. Well, like, let's talk about getting that first one. Like, how does walk us through that opportunity? Like, what do they need to have? Of course, great credit, right. you know, a concept, sure. business plan. But what are the little things that you didn't know at that point that you could put us on game ahead of time when it goes to, like, buying that first building since we're not, we're not talking to leasing right no more. We're going right. to buy Really good question. Um, The first thing is to have your credit right. Um, Beyond having your credit right, have your financials good with your business. A lot of times when businesses are established, uh, the numbers aren't right. They're not profit and loss statements. There aren't balance sheets. Maybe taxes aren't filed in time. You've got to do all those things because all you're doing is creating a file that's going to allow you to walk into the bank and say, I've got my business together. I'm worth you lending the money to buy a building. Um, With me, the first building that I bought was through the SBA as well. Okay. The SBA is ideal because the SBA only requires 10% down. Mm. Sometimes with a commercial property, they'll want 35% down. Gotcha. If you're lucky, 20%. SBA, 10% down. So my first building I bought for $640,000, I think. Mm. I was only required to have $64,000 in cash. Okay. And so that was a game changer for me. Mm. Would you say, I know this is a loaded question, would you say it's still a good time? Because all these developments coming to Dallas, I know prices have raised extremely high. Is it still a good time to buy commercial property? I think so. Prices are always going to raise. All right. Um, I'll tell you what, it's better to, to to spend your money on commercial property than to spend it on vacations and hanging out. And that's usually the alternative. Mm. Uh, and, and cash sitting in the bank doesn't appreciate the way that it should right. uh, with inflation. And so I definitely think that buying a commercial property anytime you can get one is the thing to do. Yeah, I feel like you're talking to me. I'd have been to DR, Panama, Costa Rica. <laughs> I've, I've stopped taking any trips. I'm going to chill for the trips for a little I've bit. Been there. I got to get to Costa Rica, I mean, to yeah. uh, Panama, but I've been there too, man. Yeah. But you know, you got to enjoy yourself too. Um, life is hard, work is hard. Um, for everybody, it's hard for me, it's hard for you, it's hard for people that don't have jobs too. Um, so you got to make sure you're taking care of yourself. So keep taking those trips, enjoy yourself. Nah, and for when sure. you come back, just hustle harder and make sure you're more motivated to get that bag so you can buy that building. Nah, definitely, definitely. Are you applying the same concepts when you go to like Chicago, DC, or are you leasing those? Leasing you know, buy? It's a mixture. Okay. Um, 50% own, 50% lease. Mm-hmm. I'd love to own all of it, but doesn't work out that way. Sometimes properties in a prime location, right. for example, where we are in DC at 1300 I Street Northwest, that's a premier square in all of DC. Mm-hmm. That building isn't for sale. I think the building may be 200,000 square feet, office space. I think the Bill and Melinda Ga- or Bill Gates Foundation is in that building. Okay. So, and I, I, I ain't <laughs> buying that building. They're right, not right, selling right. it to me, right? So gotcha. that's an ideal situation. Um, I purchased a building in another place. That's a fantastic situation. I'm happy with that. And then the next one may be a lease, maybe a purchase. We're looking to acquire more in Dallas too. So I'm scouring the market every day to see, actually every month to see what's available because I want another opportunity in Dallas similar to what we've got downtown now. Mm. Have you ever had problems with like giving up control? Because you have all these concepts that you created. These are yours, comes out of your mind, your creativity. And you're basically, when you open new locations, since you're not there, somebody else has to run it how you would. Has control ever been like an issue when it comes to you? Or it's like you, you've been successful in business to know how to put the right management team together to run how you would run it. You know what? It, it is a problem. Okay. It's a challenge. Look, I don't, um, I think I'm like a lot of people, man, excuse my language. I don't want to do shit, <laughs> but, but I work because I have to. Right. Um, I feel like I'm better positioned to do a lot of things that my company requires. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to creating my concepts, I create them. I design my restaurants. I design my nightclub. I design in DC, all that. But um, I have people that make decisions too. I've got people that run my security team. I've got one of my advisors runs the restaurant in Dallas, another one, the restaurant in Chicago, another one, the club. 
Um, I've got talented people that create underneath me also. And so it's, it's, it's not just me. I've got a phenomenal team of people that make things happen. I'm very, very humble and appreciative, appreciative to work with some of those people that I mentioned earlier. But mm -hmm. um, it's not me to a certain extent. But when you talk about control, um, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you're the owner of the business because you go harder, mm -hmm. because you want it more. And the challenge is trying to be at the top of the pyramid, but to have your message flow down all the way to the base mm -hmm. of that pyramid. And when you start talking about the owner, but requiring the hostess to have that same mindset, sometimes it can be a disconnect. But that's why we go to work every day to try to make that happen so we can serve the public at an optimum. Man, do you have to t sometimes ever turn on different switches when you go into different doors? Meaning the same way you go to Kitchen and Cocktails to run that business, is it different than Vivo? Is it different from the law firm? Like, oh, is it different yeah. thing about real estate? Yeah, <laughs> man, even in, even in terms of clothes, you know, yeah. I can come to work in the morning and I have on a suit like this yeah. because that's law firm time. Then maybe it's restaurant time and I'll put on a, a sweater or something mm -hmm. casual. And if it's on a Friday or night or Saturday night or where Vivo is popping, mm -hmm. then maybe I'll take that off. I'll put on a cheap tee and I'll put on three, four gold chains. So mm -hmm. sometimes I have to switch mm -hmm. uh, depending on which business I deal with. But what's, what's helped me, too, is um, each of the businesses have been good businesses, but they forced me to be a better person, period. Mm -hmm. And so I can't be as aggressive with the restaurant people as I can be in court, as I can be with the attorneys. And so it forces me to communicate better with the restaurant people, but it also forces me to be kinder and nicer with the law firm side of things, too. So um, I do have to be a different person at different times, but, you know, it's all good. I'm happy to be in this position to be able to flow from one place to another. And heck, if I get bored with the law firm people, then all I got to do is go over to Vivo and see what's <laughs> popping at the club. Does your family or friends or counterparts ever ask you, like, why, why, why invest in the club? Well, especially in Dallas, because they turn around all the time. Do they, do they ever question, like, what are you thinking? Or they understood, like, hey, turn this around or what was the thought process with that especially you know with Vivo used to be a, a couple different things I want to say you know what I didn't want the club mm -hmm. it was me um, mm -hmm. when this building first became for sale um, I insisted on buying it but you have to separate the club from the office side okay and they agreed to do it they ended up backing out of the deal so I ended up getting a lawyer to sue them because mm -hmm. I didn't want to buy the club but I wanted the office part right and what is the restaurant now um, that wasn't going to be successful so I let that threat of a lawsuit go away so I ended up agreeing to buy the club later on with the restaurant and with the uh, office space also. And it's been an ideal situation. I was hesitant at first. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a tenant over there that was called Club Medusa at the time. And um, the Medusa situation is one that I just accepted because they were my tenant. They were paying rent. Right. And their rent was enough to cover the mortgage of the whole building. So oh. it was just a winning situation. Right. Um, Medusa ran into some issues uh, during the pandemic. A lot of people don't know this story, too, how I got in the club situation. Right, right, right. And so um, they owed me a couple hundred thousand bucks. And so I called the owner at the time and said, hey, you know, look, you've got some federal criminal trouble. I can't move on that now because I have to allow due process to play itself out. But there may be some violations there. But, you know, let's sit and have a conversation about this club space and the money that you owe me. And so we sat down and I said, you know, look, you've got a private room up top. Um, the room we were at for that event last mm -hmm. time, it's called a Privé. I said, let me use this room for my restaurant. And um, in allowing me to use this room, I won't worry about the money that you owe me now. Let's let things turn around with COVID and we can find a better situation. And, and you know, we, things can work out. So I was, I was keeping it real cool with the guy. Right. So he agreed to do it, no problem. But then the next day he called and said, hey, you know, changed my mind. Not sure we're going to be able to do it. Liquor license issues. And I'm like, hey, don't worry about it. I'm a lawyer. I've got a liquor license. Right. Things are going to work out, no problem. But he told me no. And so you know what happened the day after that, right? <laughs> what happened? I, Put locks on the door and shut that <laughs> motherfucker down. <laughs> it took so, control of that. So that was the end of Medusa. Mm, that totally. was the end of it. Did and he ever tell you like the real reason why he said no? Yeah, I mean that, that may have been his concerns. I don't, I don't, I don't know. We yeah. didn't have any other conversations after that. There was to. no need to talk. Right. Need to talk because I own the building. And so that's how I got into the club business. Mm. Um, I didn't want to, but um, we were being taken advantage of, and so we just <laughs> had to do what we had to do. Turned it um, around. But with that said, what we've done is we've created something that we believe is better for the Latino community. Mm -hmm. We've designed that place. Um, so that each room is set up after a Latino country or Latino city that's mm -hmm. major, from Caracas to the uh, Madrid suite to uh, the Miami suite, that's all those things that are Latin inspired. I brought in screens in the club. We have a box in the club. We've completely renovated that space so that the Latino community can have somewhere that they feel proud of. And so um, I regret how things happen, but I'm glad that opportunity, let me back it up. <laughs> I'm glad that opportunity presented right. itself to uh, be a good servant to the Latino community because they have a club that they can be very proud of now, one that respects them very much. Do mm. you have any more club concepts coming? I do. Mm. Are they already in the works or? In works. In works, okay. In works. okay. The exclusive I'm hearing, or are you gonna wait on a little bit? Nah, well, you know, I'll tell you, we got two concepts coming to DC this summer. Okay. So a lot of people know that Kitchen and Cocktails is coming this summer, but For sure. we're also opening Canvas FDE. 
Okay. Food drinks experiences. Canvas is going to be a creative cocktail bar mm. uh, slash 4040 club slash. Oh, nice. It's going to be crazy. It's nice. going to be crazy. So Kitchen and Cocktails will open in June. Uh, Canvas is going to open in August. Mm. So that's going to be phenomenal. And we're waiting to bring that to Dallas too. Got you. So going to bring it to Dallas as well? Yeah, we'll bring it to Dallas eventually. But DC is going to get the first one. That's beautiful, man. Congratulations on that. Thank you, man. I've got a beautiful team, man. Mm. I've got beautiful people that work with me, man. The minds that are around me the support they give, the fuel that they provide me to be able to go out there and win for all of us, it's fantastic. And so that's probably one of the biggest things that I can share with you guys. And I tell my sons, Kevin and Christian, too, you know, build a team and serve your team. Be good to them. Be loyal to them. Treat them well. Pay them well. And let them play their role, whatever it may be for you, too, so everybody can collectively win and play our parts. Got you. Um, I have to ask you this before we get out of here. Um, we're in Dallas. Of course, you have concepts in Chicago and D.C., but I want to talk to you about the Dallas landscape for entrepreneurs real quick. How do you feel like it is for new business owners, especially like black and Latino owned businesses to really get ahead in this market? Um, I've been here for a while, entrepreneur about 10 years. It's a little slower than other markets that I've been you know, diving into like the Atlanta and Miami's and Houston's. It's a little slower, um, but I'm still be able to find success here, right? right. But um, what are your thoughts on the, the Dallas entrepreneurial community? I think the landscape is challenging. Mm -hmm. And I think it's challenging because I've been able to exposed to the landscape escape in D.C. and in Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. and we were talking about that earlier. You know, my restaurant in Chicago opened a year and a half ago, but I've had so many angel investment opportunities from Chicago. Um, the investment opportunity in the Bally's Casino deal, which is going to be a phenomenal investment for me as well. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of things that anybody would want to be an investor in. Who wouldn't right. want to be a part owner of a casino that's coming to a major city? Right. Um, but these things don't often come to us in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, being in Dallas and being an entrepreneur for a number of years, um, it's perplexing to me why so many things are presented to me in Chicago and in D.C., but not in Dallas. But it's really just a reminder that Dallas is still the South. And when I say the South, the old South, there's a lot of racism. There are a lot of things that are kept close to vest. And I think we just have to work harder when we're here to find our opportunity. But with that said, I think that once we get out of here, um, I think that we find the game easier for us elsewhere. We've had success in Chicago. We're going to have success in D.C. and we're going to have it beyond but I think this phenomenal training ground that we call Dallas is going to be the reason that it's happened. Nah, for sure. That's been, and I got to ask you this because this is his cosign. If you had to think about all the people you know, colleagues, employees, et cetera, who is one person that you say that you cosign that you would want you know, the world to tap in with and really give them their flowers you know, on camera? Man, the, the, the three people that I would want to give my cosign to, um, it's going to be multiple cosigns. Okay. Let's, let's do it. On the mic would definitely be Aaron Brown, Mike Ashton, and Chris Petrie. Okay. Um, a lot of people don't see those guys as big bosses because they, they're behind the scenes. But mm -hmm. these guys fuel my companies. Mm -hmm. I've been with these guys since I was 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. um, now that I'm older, we're still rocking the same way from a character perspective. But from a business perspective, we've got concepts that are doing tens of millions a year collectively. Mm -hmm. And these guys are still at the top with me. And so mm -hmm. those guys are the guys who deserve a cosign and who deserve a credit. Um, and we've got much more to do. No. Um, our, our number is going to be much higher in the next three to five years based on our concepts that are opening. But the next co-sign I give will probably be uh, Kevin Kelly the second and Christian Kelly, my two sons. Uh, I'm really pushing these guys to success. Anything that I do that I've talked about, these guys know it. And so I put the pressure on them early. Like we talked about, it goes from dictator to democracy. But it's really, really good to see them do things, such as their party, Project V, wherein one week they brought in 3,500 kids over two different parties without any violence, any incident at all. Um, to see Kevin turn down professional playing opportunities to go to Princeton because it's the number one school in the country. Mm -hmm. to see Christian progress the same way and I'm pushing him that way. Uh, I'm doing okay mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do all right, but these guys, they're gonna be the future. They're gonna do things that are gonna just blow my mind. They're gonna blow the mind of a lot of people who hear about them too. So I'm talking about them here first. That's what I say. You got to co-sign your kids. But I would say, is there a quote that, you know, you and your boys live by that you would want to tell the world to kind of like tap into if they ever feel any type of data adversity or what kind of, is there like a quote, um, something y'all refer back to to keep y'all keep going? Yeah, I got a couple of them. Uh, one that's mine is everything matters. Okay. And I always tell people that personally and I tell everybody that professionally as well. Everything matters, whether it's dust on the floor, napkin on the floor, the wall scuff, is the food hot enough? Are the people waiting in line too long at the club? When we go to court, are we arguing aggressively enough? Do we know if we're using our hands the right way? Mm -hmm. Are we wearing a shirt with a white collar in court when we shouldn't? We should have an all-white shirt on as opposed to one that has a variant tone. Um, everything matters. Uh, you heard me with my camera guys earlier. You know, yeah. so that's probably my personal quote. Um, despite how short it is, that means a lot to me. Okay. And beyond that, for the co-sign audience, um, my dad, Nelson Kelly, has told me something that has stuck with me and that I think should stick with everybody who watches this. 
Um, and he told me that if anybody else has done something before to have success, there's no reason you can't do it. And so even to the people that are looking at me and feel like maybe I've done something that they like, if I've done it, then you can definitely do it too. And credit to UKG and for Cosign for giving the people an opportunity to hear me and to hear me again reemphasize that if I've done it, you can do it. Um, and you can do it much better than me because that's how this world works out. You just got to put the work in. Just got to put the work in. Yes, sir. Man, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you allowing us in your space. A lot of gems, a lot of value. Um, before we get out of here, I just want you to give the people just your IGs. Of course, we'll put it at the bottom, but just so they can make sure they tap in with you to feel inspired, to make sure they support the concepts. Of course, coming to come leave Vivo, Kitchen and Cocktails, but any other things you want to put in the bottom, just give us your Instagrams real quick. Cool, we'll do that. But, you know, one last thing that i like to say, too, while we're on camera, um, I appreciate you communicating with me, allowing me to share this information sure. with the public, but I want to make sure we give you your respect for what you're doing, too, because Thank this you. platform, um, you're doing so much to elevate our people. You know, I'm going downstairs and I'm trying to elevate chicken and waffles, shrimp and grits experiences, dining things with families and even with the club, too, to make things better. You're working so hard to elevate our people from a business perspective and to give them the credit they need that uh, you're an unsung hero here in Dallas. I appreciate you know, that. There are so many people and, and we often forget the fact that when people are in business, you know, I tell my, my staff this with customers, you're going to have people that are going to come in that are going to be suicidal. Some are depressed. Some can't afford our product, but they're using their last money for it. Some are having a bad day. People go through so much. It's not easy to be a human being. Those same people, those same um, uh, diversity of emotions are people that you come into contact with with Cosign Magazine, and you make these people feel good as they should about what they're doing and about their challenge. So, man, I commend you so much, brother. I'm really proud of you for what you're doing, and I can't wait to see what's to come. And I sure appreciate that. Definitely appreciate that. Thanks for your time. Thanks for the kind words. You know, you don't hear it as much as, you know, when we're entrepreneurs, when we're out here just doing the work every day. You know, I don't hear that as often, but I appreciate it. Uh, that's going to keep me going for another 10 years. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Y'all, please make sure y'all follow uh, Attorney Kevin Kelly, Kitchen and Cocktails, Vivo Dallas. We definitely co-sign all the concepts, the team, the community. And I just want to make sure that, you know, y'all provide value to the people that you tap in with. And always continue to live the co-sign life. It's not just about you. You got to co-sign others. And until next time, we'll see y'all later.